And Sherry's going to talk about the work that she's doing, which is new um, for the afternoon and our oldest students, and some literacy, pre-literacy work that she's also been doing. And I think we're also going to get to take part in some activities with Sherry as well. So <clears throat> I'm kind of, I'll do the scaffolding of it all, but everybody's going to have a chance to chat. And then at the very end, too, we can have a chance for discussion or questions that come up, too. So. Um, we worked together to sort of figure out what we thought were kind of those pillars of our programming. And um, one of the first ones is free play. So we do a ton of free play. And there's just so many things that free play does for children. So it can support their gross motor work, fine motor skills, social emotional development, conflict resolution, um, and their imagination gets to grow when we're doing free play. And any uh, examples of like, what you've seen in free play for your kids in these classes. I think conflict resolution is one of the most important things that we work through in free play because they get the chance to not only experience what it's like in themselves to feel what it's like to have conflict with someone else, but we get to work with them on conflict resolution um, in a fair way. And they, you can see it. The nice thing about having mixed age classes is that you can see them grow in that. So the bigger ones are actually providing really incredible examples of how to talk to their peers and their friends and even they even change the way they, they talk to the younger students, so the younger children, compared to the way they talk to someone who's their own age. Um, and they make it a little bit more of an exception for the ones who are younger because they recognize that they are still learning. Some examples of what it's like um, for you know, the younger ones. The, I think with the, the littles, um, <clears throat> they get to be really creative and they see their peers doing different things that maybe they've never done before. And they get a chance to observe it and then try it out. And in that way, um, they challenge themselves to try something new. And I think it, it's a it's confidence building in that way yeah yeah i would agree with that and just um when i think about the imagination and the chance for the children to use their imagination it's really wonderful to watch how it starts at you know our, our three-year-olds and then it builds all the way up to these six-year-old six-year-olds that we have from you know smaller creations to now like giant houses and villages and roads and systems and so they really just get to practice thinking and practice being creative and practice working together. So, you know, sometimes I feel like we think, what is free play, you know, why are we focusing so much on free play? And that for us is just one of the biggest pillars for us. There's so much great work that comes from children getting to just play and just be. And in our programming, the teachers aren't part of that play. And so I know like at home, maybe you have to be, <laughs> or maybe you want to be. But um, our job as the teacher is to be on the outside and to not pop that bubble. Um, it's really fascinating when we do have to come towards the play, it automatically, it, the bubble is popped. And so our job as teachers is to be there to hold the space for them, but to really let them have freedom to be able to play and experience what that's like. I think I would just add that um, the importance of having it simple, like yes. you don't need a lot of stuff, you don't need a lot of things to play with or a lot of things to do things with. If you keep it simple, and it just leaves more room for them to sort of stop and say, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, and then really come into something more interesting um, that really engages them for a long time. And I'll probably say this about every topic, but it really builds <laughs> resilience, yeah. which is my thing, Sherry really loves resilience. resilience. <laughs> um, being outside in all weather, you know, yeah. all of that stuff, so mm -hmm. um, yeah. But also, important. It also um, builds resilience in trying to figure things out in academics when they're older. They'll yeah. be able to think creatively and critically in that way 
because they're, they've had that time to, to practice those skills. Um, another really important aspect of our programming is um, that the children engage in real and practical work. Um, and so that really um, creates the sense of taking care of our class community, and that's taking care of our items and, and each other and our teachers and um, all of us together as a class community. And it's doing real work together. And so they work really hard. We may haul firewood or help to rake leaves or um, split firewood for the fire. And they get to see uh, and experience that real work and then see something at the end, like a giant pile of leaves that they get to jump into. <laughs> or now we have a warm and cozy fire because we hauled all the firewood over. It definitely helps to work um, with their coordination and their, that hand-eye hand coordination as well. Um, and an example I have today is as we have our older students, they start to learn or they start to kind of forget how to play. So they're going through a, a, a different development and they're really questioning, how do I do this anymore? I have no idea how to do this anymore. And sometimes their play can become unproductive. And so practical work comes in. So today, practical work came into my classroom where <clears throat> instead of what was happening, some of my students went over to the kitchen over there and we got to wash all of our toys. And you know, at first it was like, oh man. But then it was incredible. And they just engaged in it for like 45 minutes. They cleaned everything, they dried everything, and then they started to build and make these towers out of it. And it just really turned around that um, kind of social struggle that was happening and also like a you know, teacher-student struggle that can happen and turn it into something practical and real that they could kind of re-land in and be like, oh, I do know how to be in here. I do know how to be in my body and I do know how to do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think they do take a lot of pride in, in that work, too. So they take a lot of pride in taking care of the classroom. And they also, for example, building that big slide that we're working on that needs to grow grass in the spring, um, they helped haul that dirt, and they're, they're pretty excited to be a part of that and get that up there. Um, hauling the wood chips underneath of the swings they get really excited about. We rake the leaves in the fall to get ready for the Forest of Magic and Mystery and the um, lantern walk and things like that. And so when they're walking those, they feel really proud of that work that they did um, and that they got to do it together. That's really important too. I think it builds community, um, a feeling that everyone has a job, everyone has a purpose, and it's real work. It's not you know mm -hmm. busy work. Like this is work we need to have done. Mm -hmm. You know, the tables need to be wiped at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. the, firewood needs to be hot so we have fire. So it's it's not like some giving them some job, but it's actually real work. To, yeah. And it, it shows a community working together that we all do our part. I had um, a cool moment this afternoon where I sat down as the afternoon group leader for lunch, and we made bread this morning, and one child said, oh, there's still flour on the ground. And kind of as I was walking to do something else, I was like, oh, you can sweep it up. And I looked back and she had gotten the sweepers, she'd swept everything up, and she'd put it in the compost in the fridge and then just closed the door and then went for lunch. And I was like, oh, okay. That was much more than I thought she was going to do, but we've been practicing that all year. We sweep up after we make bread and we sweep up after we eat lunch and she just knew how to do it. And so it just, it wasn't even a question of that. Any examples for your younger group and the kind of practical work that you all did? Well, I, you know, I think that Dicer. chopping vegetables is terrific oh, yeah. because for a lot of children that don't like to eat vegetables mm -hmm. or eat soup, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it is amazing when they've had the chance to chop and work toward it and then get to see the result and taste it and look for those veggies and enjoy eating them. Mm -hmm. And they all talk about it and it's, and it's wonderful. It, they talk about the shapes, the colors, mm -hmm. the taste. Um, so that, that's a real learning experience for them. Um, our curriculum is also very child-led. And so um, in our groups, we, we really work hard to create these class communities and are really working with the children as a whole. We, you know, we try to move through our day as a whole, and of course there are moments where we're not. And then we also really do strive to see each child as the individual that they are and, and learn more about them and learn what they need to flourish and to grow. 
Um, and so by having it be child-led, we're really um, meeting the needs of the whole class, all of the students, and their interests, and what their needs are. Um, it kind of helps us to, it guides us with our exploration and in the forest, like what we want to check out, what we want to do. Um, and it also creates these opportunities to hear their opinions on things. And so you'll often hear us say things like, well, what do you think? Or I wonder, instead of always giving the answer of like, you know, uh, an example for us is we had um, animal prints in the snow a couple weeks ago and the children were like, what is it? And so we brought out, we have little um, discs with animal prints and we have books about animals and we brought them out and they searched for it and it had one student looking and looking for the letters of his name. Yeah, no, he was looking for a certain type of snake. Yes. And it was a certain type of snake that starts with a B. And we said, okay, look through the guidebook and look for a snake because there's the illustration and look for the letter B. And he was doing that for like 40 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a snake that you can find in the US. <laughs> Oh, that's a raccoon print. We got to explore it together and the children got to figure that out. And then later on, as we were doing our nature walk, lo and behold, we found more of the same prints. All the children, as we were going through, I could hear them down the line being like, it's a raccoon print, it's a raccoon print. <laughs> so really going with their, we might have an idea of how the day is gonna go, but in those moments, just really helping them to uh, allow us to be led by them in their exploration. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm gonna give two examples. One of them is recently, we've had a few birthdays come through. And so we have all of our letters and things at this, at a little literacy table that we have that has, each of them have their own name card, but also they're interested in writing different things right now. And so with the birthday books, someone wanted to write happy birthday. And so we wrote out a card that said happy birthday. And so they started getting interested in learning and figuring out how to write that themselves. And then somebody wanted to write love bug. And so he ended up having <laughs> love written on there. And so he ended up doing love and then drawing a bug on her. So it, was a ladybug. it was really cute. So they, those interests of coming and asking, hey, how do you spell this? We don't just say, oh, you spell it like this. Um, we'll say, okay, let's go get a card and we'll write it out and maybe you can copy the letters and we'll talk about the different letters that they're trying to use so that it's coming from them and it's not us putting it on them. Yeah. And I think the other example that I was thinking of was <coughs> the pedagogical storytelling that we do, I think falls somewhat under that as well. Mm -hmm. I might have a story that I'm telling um, that's kind of seasonal, but if something is going on in the classroom, I might get a different story that day mm -hmm. because that kind of story will help them work it through. For example, we had some stealing of toys happening from other groups. So one group would be playing with something, this other group would go over and like take it and run away. <laughs> you know, because it's fun. <laughs> um, but it was happening a lot. And so we, instead of telling the story that I was going to tell, I told a story about a needy, greedy giant taking from the gnomes, which also had to do with our circle, our gnome circle right now. Um, and so it kind of gives them a little something to, to contemplate and think about and sort of resolve in that way, you know, through our stories. So we look at what is happening in the class too, in that way. I'm gonna move us along a little bit too. Um, the next um, sort of pillar that we really discussed together was this idea of rhythm. And so not a schedule where it's at like eight o'clock we do this, nine o'clock we do this, but this rhythm that we have and having a rhythm for children, it really allows them to know what to expect next. And in that way they can settle into their work and into their play because they're not wondering like what's gonna happen next. So they just really settle in that imagination flourishes, there's good work happens. Um, and we're really intentional about that rhythm. So we have these in-breaths and these out-breaths um, meaning like times where we're more together, maybe like um, in painting, and then these times where we really can, you know, expand like when we're out in the forest. Um, so we make sure that it has this sort of breathing pattern to it through the whole day. Um, we also start our years uh, very intentional and very much in our rhythm. 
because we want to create that safety, we want to create that class community and allow all of that good work and play to happen. And then as the year progresses and say spring is here, we're able to let go of that a little bit and like our groups will do fun snacks all together at the very end, which is a favorite of many of the children. Or we're able to sit and um, do handwork while we're outside versus you know, something mm -hmm. else that we might have needed to be a little bit more structured about because they've had that in them and it sort of is still in them. It's carrying, um, it's carrying them through and then we can like let go a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then the only other part about rhythm that I wanted to say was about our transitions. And so we're very slow and um, purposeful in those transitions. It's really not about getting from here to there, you know, we want to get from here to there. <laughs> but um, it's also about the transition and moving from here to there. And so uh, at cleanup time, you know, I might love it if all the cars and trucks just like got put away or all of the sticks that came out got put away. But it would be another child might have a great idea of using the trucks to carry all of the stumps around the whole entire room and then finally open it. Um, or getting dressed. Like it's not like, okay, let's put on your jacket, let's do this, let's get outside. You know, sometimes we might feel that inside. But we, it's really about showing care and, and, and helping them through and helping them work on doing this good work by themselves. And so um, transitions are are still a moment for us, not a let's move move on through. Any other thing anybody would want to say about rhythm? I think we covered it. Okay. Uh, and then time outside in nature is also really important to us. This gives um, the children and us the time to um, explore, to be in nature, and all of the gifts that nature can give to us. It builds resilience. <laughs> <laughs> Stamina. Uh, we can work on our balance. And we also can work on respect and understanding of the natural world in which, which we're in. Um, and I think, Sherry, you touched upon free play and you know not needing a lot of things. And I think one of my favorite times of year is the sugaring season where mm -hmm. the mixed Ks are all, we spend our whole time out in the forest um, after we've collected all the sap and we're boiling it down to make syrup. And the children are there the whole day. And you know, at first they're kind of like, what? <laughs> And then all of a sudden, there's seesaws, there's pirate ships, mm -hmm. there's, and they just really look forward to having, you know, this little stick that they have had for the last two weeks is theirs, whatever, you know, the, they might tap trees with the, that stick yeah. or something like that. So just um, nature can really provide so much for us, mm -hmm. and you don't need a lot of it. Yeah, and it's really fun to see them in that particular time sort of go off and do their play and everything, and then come back and get interested in the sap boiling and what's happening to it, and is it, you know, dark enough yet, and or is it time to add more? So they really get interested in that a lot. Anything else about outside play? I think it's a great time for, especially the littles, to learn about their, their inner balance and their core balance um, and their strength, um, which sometimes they come to us and they really don't have that kind of ability. And they very quickly um, can rely on their own feet to carry them through these roots that they're walking over and rocks and slippery snow and it's, it's wonderful to see them build that. Mm -hmm. And then sort of the final pillar that we wanted to talk about today is, is this idea of circle. Um, I do feel like ours is a unique circle um, where we're doing big movements and little movements we're doing imaginative journeys. Um, we're learning how to be together as a group. And some days it's just learning to stay in a circle. <laughs> that's actually really hard. Um, and so we might just practice that for a long time. And then finally we're able to move together in a circle or follow each other through, through the classroom. It's about uh, remembering all of the songs and the verses that we bring. We're crossing the midline. We're bringing in rhythm. Um, and again, we're really touching in on that idea of imagination. Um, we're also able to celebrate different things like the seasons and festivals and stories in our circles. And I think something that's also maybe unique to us is um, kind of merging two different pedagogies. So really bringing in a little bit more explicit um, pre-literacy and literacy work through different um, curriculum. This is um, Hegarty and we all use it in our 
uh, mixed gaze and you'll all get to experience circle in just a moment and you can um, see how we mix the two together. So they still get this imaginative journey but they also get to play around with letter sounds and letters and numbers and understanding all of that as well. And the implicit stuff that happens um, during circle in our verses that we say and the, the journeys that we go on and the songs that we sing are things like alliteration and um, rhyming um, and things like that are really important. And as she said, like memorizing those verses is really important too. In that work. I think it's really important for spe speech development. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, hearing those enunciations mm -hmm. and when you know you're in circle and it's a hard K or it's a soft O and they learn those things and start to really enjoy them with their whole being, not just as a right, as a as an act of making that sound. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know it's a little bit crowded, but um, I wanted to give us the opportunity to move with it up just to also experience um, the circle. And I feel like as we finish up the circle, that will be the perfect time if people want to scoot up, because I won't take forever. Um, so I'm just going to lead us through what I'm doing right now in my circle, and you'll get to see a little bit of um, the pre-literacy and literacy work that we do. There's just an accused journey. Um, so, we all start, everybody gets to do it. Uh, we all start in a circle and we do the same clapping pattern every single day. And right now my students are so excited because for the most part we can do it at the very exact same time as a whole group, which is very cool because before it was like, <laughs> now it's really, and all the children, we're doing it! So, that's what we do. impressed me so much. Middle sounds are very, very hard, and they're nailing it. So, can you please tell me the middle sound when you when I say the word dig? What's the middle yeah. sound? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> what about ran? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If I say ox and add b, what do we have to the beginning? B to the beginning. 
container in a jar from my backpack. <laughs> we open up our pajamas. Or no, it's not pajamas, it's just hot chocolate. Mm. It's hot chocolate. <laughs> So, the children think four is huge. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pretend Cherry said four. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Take a sip and drink it up. Put your pants away. You have it. Put your jar away. And off we go. And then I will. Stop us, but we would go through a big long journey again. We come back home, we have to put our things back in the shed, we have to go inside, we have to take up all of our gear, and then we used to run up the stairs, but they got too wild. So we <laughs> walk really slow. Yeah. <laughs> and then we go into bed, and from there, um, they're all resting down, and that's where I share my story. So that's a, uh, an idea. <laughs> and I think now if there are people who um, would like to scoot over to the other building. I wanted to start off talking about um, this ed support training that the Waldorf ed support training that I did and just briefly um, my experience which was I've been here in the EC teaching the EC in various capacities um, I started in this classroom as an assistant to Karen and did various other things over the years. But um, about seven or eight years ago, I did the Waldorf Ed Support Training after being really inspired by Carla Hannaford's um, book, Smart Moves. And um, I loved it. It was such a wonderful training. It's, it's about working with children who are having challenges um, with behavior or with learning and ways physical integrative movements and artistic activities to help them um, move through those challenges. And what I came to at the end of that two and a half year, two year training was actually what we're doing in the EC, how important it really is and how amazing what, what is happening in here is, how integrative everything that is happening here is. And I didn't want to leave the EC. You know, I, um, my training was, was working with three year olds to, um, 12th graders and I love that you see so I, I you know stayed here um, and I feel like that I just wanted to sort of start with that when then when this job possibility for the afternoon with what I'm doing um, working with the rising children to be able to do my first grade readiness assessments and just embed them in and do all this work with these children it's really like a, it was a total dream job I, it is a dream job um, I'm really, really thrilled to be doing it. And it feels like, for me, it was like putting the two pieces together, this the ed support stuff, and the, still staying in the early childhood. Um, so I just wanted to give a little background about what that is. Um, the one thing I'd say about what I'm doing now is that there's so much to it. Like, I'm the first one to be able to geek out on all the science, the brain science with movement and all of that stuff. And yet, really, the important part for all of us, we would all agree, I'm sure, is um, holding the children with warmth and joy and really um, striving to see each child for who they are. And for me, what that, the, the more I can, we talk about being removers of hindrances in the ed support training, and the more that I can help a child to remove the hindrances, which we all have, there's genetics, there's everything. Who knows why we are the way we are, right? Um, the more I feel like a child can truly see and find their spark, what I call like their spark. That we, I think we all have like a spark of what, what is what, something we love. And it might be something we're naturally good at or it might be something we're really not naturally good at and we have to work 20 times harder to do this thing that's, that's our spark for our life. And so for me, that's the most important part. And so I'll get into the specifics of all the stuff that I'm doing, but that's what I'm holding um, when I'm working with the children and um, also wanting them to continue to have a joy for learning for the rest of their lives. And that's what the Waldorf education, I feel like, is so strong at is it, it's fun, it's joyful, and it's hard work too. It, I don't want to make it sound like everything has to be fun and it, we don't, you know, we can't do that. Um, so that holding that for me, and I think that's an important part of it. 
Um, so I had a first grade teacher talking to me about how they had like, they had the children over here that they come to, they get these children their first day of first grade and there's these children that are like, they don't, haven't learned their letters yet. They don't know letter sounds like they're really, there are these ones over here and then the ones over here that might be reading chapter books and, um, and how hard that is to like, like teach a class of all of those ch children. And my hope would be to take those ones that haven't learned le letters yet and I'm just gently starting to introduce what, what the work, you know, I don't, a lot of stuff I don't have to say because what she's doing is a lot of what I'm doing, but um, what all of them are doing, what Lindsay brought. Um, but gently bring in a fun, joyful, playful way so that they have a little better sense of the letters for first grade. So they're coming over here a little bit. And then these ones reading chapter books, not always, but sometimes they're the ones that, um, do they, how do they do socially? How do they do, um, do they have a strong enough course so they can sit at a desk for 40 minutes to do their work? Like, cause if you don't, if you don't have a strong core, you're gonna, or good balance, you're just gonna, you know, <laughs> you're not gonna be able to do that even no matter what capacities you have. Um, and do they know where the end of their shovel is? You know, do they know where their body is when they're waiting in line to not like, you know, smash into people? So like we can work with those things with those children and these with these. So it's still going to be like this, but maybe it won't be quite so far. So that's my hope is to sort of bring um, balance, a little more balance. And I'm excited to be able to, to have a picture of most of the children that are in our, um, in the rising first grade to bring to that first grade teacher along with, of course, their morning teachers. And I'm also in contact always with all, like we're talking, you know, at all times about the children. So there's never a point where like, I would know, think something and someone else would enter vice versa. We're, we're always in contact. Um, okay, so the things that I am working with are, that I, I like to divide it up to simply into four things, which are core and floor, I'm gonna come back to what they are. Hands and feet, like fine motor, basically. Balance, and then eyes and ears, which is auditory visual. And everything I'm doing can pretty much be put into one of those categories. Um, core and floor, I touched on a little bit. Like if you don't, ha if you don't have a core, you're not gonna be able to sit up at a desk and, and do your work. Um, there's also something called retained reflexes, which I am not an occupational therapist, but we did touch on people who have these immature movement patterns um, some people are familiar with the moral reflex, which is you know the baby gets startled and their arms go up. These should integrate through physical movements, but for various reasons, they don't always. And there are physical exercises that I've done some other trainings on that can help integrate. And so every day we do a yoga adventure, movement adventure, and we're integrating, we're doing core work, we're doing that every single day. Um, there's so much of a, re you know, if the brain is being wired by physical movement. Um, so then there's hands and feet, which is really fine motor. So we do, we're practicing tying, um, you know, in order to be able to hold that pencil when they, you know, are, are getting to the work they need to strengthen. And so, you know, there's Play-Doh, there's puzzles, there's um, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then balance. It's similar to the core where, again, if you don't have good balance, we see the younger ones that come to us that fall off their chair. And um, so if I don't have any this year that are five and six that do, but, um, it happens sometimes and so it's just working with balance and so I have a I have a balance beam in my room and I have I brought over some things to show you but I have some bean bags I made and so they're you know they're practicing with balance and and we do that along with like they might roll well, I'm getting ahead of myself but I'll just tell you <laughs> they might roll dice count what they rolled and then count like if they roll a three they go one two three one two three walking on the balance beam so it's it's using your, your verbal skills, intellect, as well as balancing. And then they're getting some numeracy because they're having to learn what a six dots looks like, mm -hmm. um, which is supposed to be good um, for numeracy. And then auditory and visual, which is a large part of what I do. We do rhyming, all of us do, and I do rhyming every day. I have a heavy ball we toss around. It's totally fun. It's not, you know, if they don't get rhyming yet, we just laugh and we move on and we keep going. I, I can say this class that I have this year is just joyful. They just love it. Even if they, they just laugh if they get it wrong and it doesn't matter. It's not like, it doesn't feel like a test. It doesn't feel like anything like that. And so the auditory visual is super important. Um, if a child can't 
process auditorily, they're not going to be able to understand that a ah goes with an a. And so it's that's why nursery rhymes are a thing. You know, people knew this without knowing the science behind it hundreds of years ago. So we lots of exposure to rhymes, and we we at this point with the five and six year olds, like they can come up with their own rhymes. And at the same time that I'm playing these games with them, they're learning things and they're being exposed, but they're also, I'm also assessing without them knowing. Um, so I'm saying, you know, who really can't rhyme, even though we've been doing this for a few months? And, and you know, that can just be an indicator of maybe they have a little bit of a challenge. And so no big deal, but we'll let the parents know and we can catch it. And, um, and so it's both like I'm teaching and I'm watching, again, with the movement, who can balance? Who, who's nervous about the balance beam. Like some of them are really nervous to go on it and others are plopping three, um, you know, <laughs> steam eggs on their head and they're walking across, you know, counting. Um, and some of them go really fast and so they fall off and you know, the ones that go so slow and careful. It just tells so much about them and helps me to see them, you know, that seeing part. Um, and then there's the breaking up word sounds, all of the stuff um, that Lindsay mentioned. Um, and then some of the literacy work that I'm doing, I'm trying to think, I've said most of it. There's some other, we'll use natural materials and make letters and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and we will be, this will be new for me, but I have agreed that we will start to do some drawings of capital letters in the spring together. So we're going to start that one and we'll do it in a story based way and uh, we'll see. How that goes but I'm excited to be able to bring that uh, in a way that feels Waldorfy that feels like we're allowing them to still be in that dreamy land and it's fun and it's low pressure and it's this exposure that will be great for the ones that haven't had that exposure um, and let's see what else um, okay I think we're at the point where I'm gonna show you we do a lot of puzzles too. Like I have the free play after lunch. We just, I mostly put out puzzles and it, that's really fun. I'm gonna show you a couple things I have. There are a couple games and then we're gonna do a movement. So we've got five minutes, so. Uh -huh. Oh, and we read, oh my gosh. We, we read these chapter books, the Gnome, um, Lim, Tales of Limador Woods. And they are just the sweetest things. The gnomes have this like, they have these values and they're kind and you're always, I mean, it's just the sweetest thing and they're all just waiting that they miss a day. They're like, what did I miss? You know, some of them, chapter. yeah, I mean, every one of them loves it and some really like love it more than anything. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of things. Okay, this is my, um, you can pass it around if you want. That's my heavy ball, it's a weighted ball and that's something we'll toss while we do rhyming and it just like, we can, we'll do rhymes. Sometimes I'll make, we just make up rhymes like apple orchard rhymes with that being an apple or you know there's all sorts of I often wing it and we just mm -hmm. laughingly make up rhymes you know yeah. um I'm going to show you this is my fun the fun one right now that because we don't have that much time time goes so quickly I made these little things and my mentor gave me this idea so I can't take full credit for it I've so I made these little pouches and one side's a washcloth to make it thicker. You'll see why. And so I hand these out and they unroll them and then they have something in there and I tell them to dump out what's in there. You have something else in there. And I tell them to take note of what you have there. And so we've got a clear gem and a blue gem, a white die. I have die, dice that are blue and red and black and all this. And a penny and a shell. So we take note of what's in there. And then we're going to put that back. And then I show them how to roll it up the first time and then they get it and put all the things at the bottom and we roll it back up and then we're practicing tying and very few of the children know how to tie. So tying, just because we don't have to tie shoes anymore, it's a really good <laughs> fine motor activity. And if I could do this again, I would make these a little longer because the early tires, it's a little short for them. But we tie it again up and then we made up together this funny rhyme about this like old dog. The old dog is old because if it was too young, it would be a puppy and it would be wild, but it's an old dog that goes slow. <laughs> you know, and so this is, <laughs> and I can't remember it off the top of my head. It's like, uh, it was an old dog named Bill. He, he was bringing his person a gift over the hill 
and he walked around the car and you know I don't know but I put a car way over on the other side of the room they tuck this under their chin and go all the way around the car and come back and so this integrates some reflexes doing that movement so it's a you know it's a wave and it's hard you can't really see you know you have to be careful and it takes a couple minutes and we did the rhyme before it and so that's like you know they're all doing that it's a couple minutes and then I say okay do you remember what's in your pouch <laughs> and so they tell me if they remember what's in their pouch and I take note but no one cares it's not a, like when they don't remember it's like oh yeah there was a blue one not a gray you know not a gray one or whatever you know it's just really low pressure and they have to roll it up and tie it again so they have to they're they're practicing their tying and i go around and show them how to tie because most of them don't know how to do that um darn it's late <laughs> i bet okay. they got started a little later over okay. there so um, I don't quickly i'll just show you a couple other things i have a balance beam and they have the option i sort of described that one roll a die what do you roll um just being able to look at a die and 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 it's sub subtization, I think is what it's called. It's, it's supposed to be really good for them to just be able, you know how you look at the six yeah. on a die and you know what it is, like adults do. The children, some of them are still counting to see how many to go and others are starting to do that. So it's just a sense of number, you know, it helps with a sense of number. And then, you know, some of them literally have three on their head and some carry two and put one on their head. <laughs> There's all, you know, it's really fun to watch. Uh, I have this game, which, you might not be able to see, but they're like dominoes with numbers on them. And then I have all these dominoes and you have to match up. It's just a little quiet game that they do sometimes. You match up the four, you know, the one that has four dots on one side and one on the other with the four and the one, just to learn numbers. Um, again, they're getting the sense of number from all these dominoes. And another similar one where there's all these little, um, I put numbers on these and then we have these sort of wooden Lego like things and so you would to you would build a cityscape and so there's three here so one two three and five there and three there so it, it turns into like a little building I feel like if you can't see this you might not understand but um, they love it they, they find it fun and they're learning their numbers that way and um, da, 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 da. yeah okay Let's just do our ending game thing that I do. It's fun. So, and then we, and the story is about 15 minutes, and then we um, do about a 10 to 15 minute yoga adventure, and sometimes it's a movement adventure. I have um, training in various things, so I just call it a movement adventure for most of them. But anyway, this is something um, that you all probably know, but it's really fun. All right, you ready? Yeah. And this is when I'm ready for them to be silly. Oh, gosh. And, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes I deal with smaller groups of them because I'm like, oh, no, I get it. So, okay. Hi, my name is Jo, and I work in a boxing factory. I have a wife and a dog and a family. One day, my boss came up to me, and she said, hey, Joe, are you busy? I said, no, and she said, push the button with your right hand. <laughs> Hi, my name is Joe, and I work in a button factory i have a wife and a dog and a family one day my boss came up to me and she said hey joe are you busy i said no and she said push the button with your left hand <laughs> hey my name is joe and i work in a button factory i have a wife and a dog and a family one day my boss came up to me and she said, hey, Joe, are you busy? I said, no. And she said, push the button with your right foot. <laughs> Hi, my name is Joe. And I in a boxing factory. I have a wife and a dog and a family. One day, my boss came up to me and she said, hey, Joe, are you busy? I said, no. Push the button with your left